you who are coming in for the first time this afternoon. Pastor Steve Wahlberg is the speaker director for White Horse Media. He's well known for the radio television through the, his many books. Uh, you can learn more about his ministry through whitehorsemedia.com. He lives in Priest uh, River, Idaho with his wife, Christine, and their children, Seth and Abby. One of the things, too, that uh, I want to share some personal note about Pastor Steve Wahlberg is that um, we, uh, we went through the seminary, and it was after the seminary where all the seminarians had to go through a field school of evangelism. There were three of us that uh, had the opportunity to train on, and mentor under Pastor Mark Finley. And so Pastor Steve Wahlberg and myself and another pastor uh, trained under Mark Finley for at least three months. So we cherish those uh, times and experience together. And so we are grateful that he is able to come here in Nashville, especially for this special convocation. We're glad again that you're here. Thank you for, for joining us. We're honored by your presence. And now let's invite the Holy Spirit to be with us as we start our afternoon session. Father in heaven, we need your Holy Spirit to be right here, right in our midst, right in our hearts. We pray for a special blessing upon the presentations um, this afternoon, Lord. I pray that you will uh, sp you use the speakers, pour your spirit upon your instruments so that we can hear your messages clearly. Help us to be able to honor you, Lord, and help us to, to remember how we need to make sure that we are ready for your soon coming. Thank you for hearing my prayers in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Pastor C. Okay. Thank you, Pastor Melvin. All right. Well, good afternoon. Good to be here. Still here. You're still here. It's been a good morning so far, and now we're into the afternoon meetings. Uh, for those that are watching on the stream, this is part three of our Warn the Cities convocation here in Nashville, Tennessee. Today is July 23rd. Uh, the first meeting was on the coming judgments of God. We talked about what's happening in the world, uh, in America, around, around the world. There's just so many things going on right now. It just makes you, your head spin, and it makes you want to get out of here and go to a better place, doesn't it? That's for sure, and that's what the Bible teaches, that one of these days there will be a better place for us to live. And then the second meeting was uh, part two, and it was called Wise or Foolish. We had a Bible study from Matthew chapter 25, where we looked at what Jesus said about his people as we enter the final days, and how half are wise, half are foolish, and the thing that impressed me, and I'm trusting you too, is that we want to be among the wise. We want to be among those that are getting ready for what is coming upon the earth. All right, this third talk is uh, very interesting. This is going to be quite significant. Let's see, is my clicker on? Oh, it's, let's see, there we go. Fire from the sky. Fire from the sky. If you have questions about part three or part two or part one, we have a bucket up here. You can put your questions uh, in the box at the end of this part three. We also have a text. Do you remember the text phone number? 810-240-8800. That's great. You remembered your wife's cell phone. <laughs> I don't even remember my wife's cell phone because I just look in my phone and it says uh, Kristen Cell and I either push it or sometimes voice activated. So very good for you. Uh, okay, so if you'd like to text in your questions, and that's just for those that are outside, those that are watching, uh, wherever you may be, and I just want to repeat what I said before, and that is that the cell phone texting option is just for today, July 23rd. I don't think the pastor's wife wants to be getting a lot of texts in the next couple of months. So that's just for today. All right, if you have a Bible, if you have your Bible, I'd like you to open up to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. And once you've got that, I can hear pages turning. Probably some people are clicking on your phones or your tablets. That's all fine. 
Once you've got that, we will pray. All right, let's bow our heads and let's, let's talk to God. Dear Father in heaven, we pray to you as a group here in Nashville, Tennessee. We pray for your spirit, the Holy Spirit, to come down from above, come down from heaven, talk to our hearts, and help us to understand the amazing things we are going to be looking at this afternoon. Please bless us and speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I'd like to start with Luke chapter 21. And I've got my Bible open here. You see it also on the screen, so you'll get a double whammy. You can see it right in front of you, or you can see it on the screen, or both. Jesus, in Luke 21, is talking about the future. He's talking about what's going to be happening on earth right before he returns. And in verse 25, Jesus said, there would be, and what will there be? He said, there will be signs, that's right, in the sun and in the moon, and in the stars. So he's pointing us up above to signs in the heavens, things that are happening above us. And then he says, and on the earth, what's going to be going on on the earth is distress of nations with perplexity. Does that sound familiar? The word distress sounds a lot like stress. You just, you know, make it a little bit longer to distress. And we live in a stressful age, don't we? People are all stressed out. There's stress seminars. There's stress uh, books about stress, stress management, all kinds of things to deal with stress. Uh, this verse is really talking right about our generation. And then when Jesus said there would be stress, distress on earth, he said with perplexity. Now, this word here, perplexity, is a very interesting word. In the, in the original Greek, the word there means with no way out. And doesn't that just perfectly fit our world? I mentioned this this morning. My conviction is that whoever gets into the White House in November uh, of this election year, that no human being, whether Republican or Democrat or Independent or anybody, no human being can permanently solve the problems of this world. There is really no way out except up, except it's the Lord coming down from heaven. And that's what Jesus is talking about. Nations under distress with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So Jesus starts out with signs in the sky and then he ends verse 26 with signs in the sky. The powers of heaven will be shaken. So that tells me that there's going to be things that are going to be going on up there. And this happens right before Jesus comes because the very next verse says, then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So we have the signs in the heavens, distress upon the earth, no way out, and the next thing is Jesus comes. So we're, we're right on track, aren't we? We're heading toward Jesus coming. Now, here's another passage. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 also points to things happening in the heavens, and I'm building up to eventually getting to uh, the topic of fire from the sky. Acts chapter 2, Peter gave a long talk, and he's quoting from the Old Testament, from the book of Joel, and let's especially look at verse 17. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. And Peter said that it shall come to pass in the last days, quoting Joel, the last days, says God that your sons and your daughters shall do what? Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. I'm going to come back to that. Your young men shall see visions. They'll be prophesying. They'll be visions, according to the Bible. 
and your old men shall dream dreams. There'll be prophecies, visions, and dreams. That's what the Bible says. And on my men's servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders, God says, wonders where? In heaven above. So again, just like in Luke, uh, Peter and Joel, the Bible is pointing up above us. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. And then he, he mentions three different things. Blood, and what's the second one? Fire. Fire and vapor or pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now Peter here in Acts 2 is quoting the book of Joel and obviously there was a, an application in Peter's day to some of this prophecy. The Holy Spirit was being poured out. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. But this, this prophecy goes beyond Pentecost. It takes us all the way down to the time, right? It says before the great day of the Lord. So I believe this prophecy has a dual application to the time of Pentecost and prior to the second coming of Christ. That's the ultimate focus of the prophecy is what's going to be going on. And again, just like Jesus did in Luke chapter uh, 17, or was that 21? Where did I start with? Luke 21. Again here, Peter and Joel are pointing us to things that are going to be happening in the heavens. Do you see that? Signs up there. And part of those signs have to do with fire. Fire, this is where we're leading to the topic of fire from the sky. Now, uh, what I'm going to tell you next is very, very interesting. It may be new information for some of you that are watching uh, on the live stream or later on watching the DVD or watching as these programs are recorded and as they continue to uh, be viewed. But I'm going to tell you some very interesting things. And I'm just going to be very open and honest with you. How's that? That's what I, you know, we all should do that. That's the way we should be. Uh, we are holding this, this series of meetings here in what state are we in? We're in Tennessee. And what, uh, what's the name of the city that we're in? Nashville. Right, Nashville. Boy, maybe you should say that. Let's just do that again. Nashville. Yeah. Wow. Nashville, Tennessee. Now, there is... Uh, a reason why we're doing this in Nashville, which I'll explain to you in just a little bit. We are actually inside the Nashville First Seventh-day Adventist Church. Correct? You know that. And I'll let the viewers know that uh, those that are watching online or the stream, that that's where we are. Now, let me just make a few uh, comments that Seventh-day Adventists, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, is a church that believes in the Bible. We believe in God's book. We believe in Jesus Christ, that Jesus is our Savior, that he died on the cross for our sins and he rose from the dead. We believe in salvation by grace through faith in Jesus as our Savior. That's a strong belief of the Adventist church. We believe in the Ten Commandments, that God has a law, a moral law. I showed you this this morning that God wrote with his own finger uh, Ten Commandments on stone and that these Ten Commandments can never be changed. They're not up for negotiation. It's not a matter of us taking a vote on how many of these commandments we like or don't like. But these commandments were written with the finger of God, and they cannot be changed. They're written on solid rock. And one of these commandments, in fact, I'll put these down and hold up this one. One of the commandments, one, two, three, four, says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And it tells us that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. And Seventh-day Adventists believe this. That's why we keep the seventh-day Sabbath, because God wrote this 
with his own finger on stone. The name Seventh-day Adventist basically means that we are Seventh-day Sabbath keepers who are waiting for the advent of Jesus Christ. Amen. The advent has to do with his coming, his second coming. So that's who we are. We are believers in Jesus who know we're saved by grace, and because we love the Lord, we want to keep the Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath, as we wait for his coming. That's what a Seventh-day Adventist is all about. And all of this is based on the Bible. Now, as a church, we also believe something else, which uh, is very interesting, somewhat controversial, and yet it is what we believe <coughs> based on the Bible. And let me go back to the screen here and show you what the Bible says. We see here, Acts chapter 2, verses 17 to 21, that God says, now notice who's talking here? God says that he's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and there will be visions and there will be dreams. That's what the Bible says. And this is what God says. And Seventh-day Adventists believe that there was a daughter. There was a daughter in the history of this movement, the Seventh-day Adventist church, as it was developing in the 1800s into what it is today, that there was a daughter of the Lord who was given the gift of prophecy, that she prophesied. She had visions. She had dreams. And these dreams and visions were a fulfillment of Scripture, that the Lord predicted that he would do this, that he would do this. And this uh, woman, this daughter, her name used to be, she's dead now, her name was Ellen G. White. Ellen White. There's a picture. Uh, it's not exactly a photograph, but it's an artist's uh, picture of her when she was 17 years old, when she had her first vision. And this is a little book that I've written. It's a pocket book, just like the coming judgments of God that we gave to you after the last meeting. So we have another little book. And where is that book? Here it is. It's, uh, it's just a little pocket book. It's a small book. It's easy to share. And it introduces Ellen White and her writings and her visions and her dreams based on the Bible, based on what the Word of God says. Uh, this was her first. She had a, a dream when she was, or a vision when she was 17 years old, and she saw a, a, a pathway high above the world. And she saw people on that pathway heading toward the New Jerusalem. And Jesus was at the far end of the path, and he was encouraging his people to stay on the path and to keep their eyes on him and to prepare for his coming. Ellen White was born in 1827. She died in the year 1915. During her life, she had approximately 2,000 visions and dreams. She wrote uh, approximately 40 books. These books have been translated into at least 140 languages around the world. She has become, amazingly, the most translated female author of all time. There's no woman who has ever written books that have been translated into more languages than Ellen White. <clears throat> the spring 2015 issue of the Smithsonian Magazine, you've heard of the Smithsonian Institute, a very famous, prestigious magazine, uh, listed Ellen White as, quote, one of the 100 most significant Americans of all time. So she's written a lot of books, she's had a lot of influence, and even Smithsonian recognized that. I'm here today because Jesus got a hold of me 37 years ago. Uh, I used to be quite wild. Uh, I, I lived a very different life than I live right now. I grew up in the Hollywood Hills in Southern California. When I was a teenager, I got lost in the world and its evil ways, uh, all of the music, surrounded by Hollywood, and I got into drugs and drinking 
and just living a wild, wild, crazy life. I was totally lost. Uh, sometimes I tell people that I was, I was a pot smoking, cocaine snorting, disco dancing, lost Jew. <laughs> That's what I was. My family is very secular. We, were, we are Jewish, uh, but we are very secular. We never read the Bible. We never prayed until I was 20 years old. A whole lot of things happened in my life, and then somebody, it's a long story, handed me a copy of a book that Ellen White wrote. And the book is called The Desire of Ages, which is a book on the life of Jesus, based on the Bible, based on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I didn't care who wrote the book. I didn't know anything about her. But when this man handed me a copy as a 20-year-old of Desire of Ages, by that time, there was a real stirring inside me that I needed, I needed help. I needed God. And I read that book in Southern California. And that book, the Lord used that book to show me the love of Jesus Christ to show me that Jesus was my savior, to show me that Jesus gave his life for me, he suffered in Gethsemane, he died on the cross, he rose from the dead, he went to heaven, and he's coming back. And uh, when I read that book, I tell you, when I was done with it, I was a different person, totally different. Uh, I went to North Hollywood High School as a teenager, and then after I became a Christian, uh, as Pastor Dave mentioned, we went to seminary together. <laughs> Big change. And I don't, I don't give Ellen White herself the credit for what God has done for me. I see, and I'm sure she would be the first to admit this, she was a channel for the Lord to work through her to change my life and to point me to the Bible and to point me to Jesus. And I'm very grateful, very grateful for that. Now, anyway, I'm telling you all this for a reason. And the reason is this, that this same woman in the year 1904, when she was still alive, 11 years before she died, this woman had a dream. She had a dream. And remember, the Bible says that uh, daughters shall prophesy and shall have visions, and there will be dreams. So she had a dream. And in this dream, <clears throat> this is what she said. <clears throat> Here's just a part of it. In 1904, she wrote, actually, a few months ago, I had a very impressive dream, and I seemed to see a great ball of fire come from heaven and strike the earth. That's what she saw in her dream. She saw a fireball, something, some ball of fire. Now, again, there's a, there's a reason why we're having this meeting in Nashville, Tennessee. And I think most of you, or at least a lot of you, know that reason. And that is this, because six months later, after she had the dream, she then made this statement. Look at this. She said, when I was at Nashville, she was here in this town, and she, or this city, and she was speaking. She said, I had been speaking to the people, and in the night season, there was an immense ball of fire that came right from heaven and settled where? And settled in Nashville. Yeah, wow. Uh, she, she said this. And in just a few minutes, I'm going to turn this podium over to my associate, Tim Saxton, who is the administrative director of Whitehorse Media. He's done a lot of research on this topic and he's going to go into some of the background and some of the information behind this dream that I think will be very interesting and informative to you. And then, as we mentioned, the last meeting, after we take a break when we're done, uh, for, from segment three, is we'll have a Q&A so we can field questions. Because we are here to discuss this. And this, uh, this dream has stirred a lot of people. A lot of people, including me. Now, before I turn the time over to Tim to have him explain more about this, I'd like to look at one more section in the Bible. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis 18. 
let's go back to the Old Testament. I've recently been reading this, uh, this chapter, Genesis 18, and it's very, there are some things that have just jumped out at me that are very, very important for us today. Genesis 18, verse 1, starts out with this. Then the Lord appeared to him, this is talking about Abraham, by the terebinth trees of Mamre. Any, any terebinth trees around here? I don't know. I don't even actually know what a terebinth tree looks like. But there were trees back then in Abraham's time, and, and uh, near those trees the Lord appeared to him as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted up his eyes and he looked, and behold, there were three men. And the Lord was one of these. The Lord took human form, and he was one of these men, and the other two were angels, and they were all in human form. And they had come to visit Abraham and to talk to him about many things. And it says that uh, when Abraham saw them, he ran from his tent door to meet them, and he bowed himself to the ground. And he said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant, but please let, let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree. I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts and afterwards you will pass by after they have a meal together. And so the three men agree, which was really the Lord and two angels, and he tells uh, his wife and I think a servant to, uh, to help get the food ready. And so they had a meal together, as you keep reading, we're not going to read every verse, but they had a meal together, and at the end of the meal, two of the angels went on toward Sodom. They were on a mission, which we read about in chapter 19, which was the destruction of Sodom. And we talked about that earlier, that Sodom and Gomorrah had become so wicked, there was so much evil going on in Sodom that its last night was approaching. And remember how Sodom was destroyed? By fire. Fire from the sky. Fire came down and destroyed those cities. Sodom, Gomorrah, and other cities. That's what it says in Genesis chapter uh, 19. Now, back to chapter 18. In verse 16, it says, Then the men arose from there and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on the way. And verse 17 is the verse that has really impressed me. Verse 17 says, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? And I think some translations say, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing that I am about to do? And what was God about to do? He was about to destroy Sodom with fire from the sky. And so he's saying, shall I hide this from Abraham, my chosen servant? And the Lord decided, no, I'm not going to hide this from him. In other words, God was going to reveal to his chosen servant Abraham what he was about to do. You following me? Whenever God does something big, he shows his servants the thing he's about to do. He does that consistently in the Bible. Uh, one of the biggest examples of that is the days of Noah. God was going to send a flood to destroy a wicked world. And God decided to reveal this information to his chosen servant, Noah. And it's very interesting, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, Hebrews 11, 7 says that Noah was divinely warned of things that were not yet seen. And then because of that, he believed that warning, and he went to prepare, he began the process of preparing the ark. It's, the Bible says he was divinely warned about the future, and that future was the flood. 
And this is what's happening in Genesis 18 as God is getting ready to destroy Sodom. Sodom was about ready to be destroyed, and the reason is in verse 20. The Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, because their sin is very grave. So that's what we see. Just quoting uh, in the book of Luke, chapter 17, verses 28 to 30, Jesus also says, as it was in the days of Lot. He said, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So Jesus draws a parallel again between Lot's day, the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's going to be that way again. And as I mentioned, and as the Bible says, right before God did that destruction, before he sent that fire down from the sky, he informed Abraham of what he was about to do. And so it's very consistent. It's consistent with Scripture that if there is coming a time when God is going to be sending fireballs from the sky in fulfillment of biblical prophecy, which prophecy says there'll be fire. We read that in Acts. Prophecy says that there'd be signs up in the heavens. It would be consistent that as we get closer to those events, that God would not hide from his servants the things which he is about to do. And, uh, and as Tim is about to come up here, and as he shares more information about the dreams of Ellen White, uh, we strongly believe that God revealed to her this information, just like he gave information to Abraham, just like he gave, he gave information to Noah. Now we also, and Tim will make this clear as well, that uh, she saw more than fireballs coming alone on Nashville, that these balls are going to come in many places, many places, not just one city. And Tim, uh, I think we're ready to have you come up and explain these things. Tim has some slides. Uh, he's my associate. We're good friends. And Tim, God bless you. Thank you for being up here. He's going to take over for a little bit. And then I'm going to come back up and we'll move toward the conclusion of, uh, of part three of this convention on warning the cities, this convocation. Right. <clears throat> Make sure this mic is on. Is my mic on? It's coming up red. I'll just use the pulpit mic, that's fine. Is it on? All right, all right. In the Bible, all right, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, there's a section towards the back of the Old Testament that's referred to as the Minor Prophets. Has anybody ever read out of the Minor Prophets? Now, be honest, when you've read in the Minor Prophets, when you've read about judgment coming on Edom and how that is described in detail and judgment coming on Moab and judgment coming on all these countries from Israel's day, have you ever found it a little dry as if to say, well, why is all this in here and what application does it have for me today? Have you ever wondered that? I remember when I was younger and I was starting to read the Bible, coming across that, I found it just very uninteresting. But over time, the Lord showed me that the minor prophets were anything but minor. They actually have rich truth that is applicable to us today. And I found this quote from a section called Manuscript Releases. There we go. Number 1517. And this is from Ellen White, and she says, In the night season I've had many presentations of the judgments of God coming upon our cities. And now I can understand better the real meaning of these scenes that I have witnessed. Now, she says that because this was about the time of the San Francisco earthquake, and she had visited San Francisco and saw the destruction, and she says, Oh, how soon the scenes of destruction and desolation will come and be universal, we cannot tell. But be ye also ready, saith the Lord, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Now, after she said that, when you read manuscript releases, then she quotes from the following books. 
She quotes from the book of Micah, one of the minor prophets, the book of Habakkuk, the book of Zephaniah, the entire book, the book of the first four chapters of Zechariah, and the entire book of Malachi. And then she says this, these scenes will soon be witnessed just as they are described. I present these wonderful statements from the scripture for the consideration of everyone. The prophecies recorded in the Old Testament are the word of the Lord for the last days and will be fulfilled as surely as we have seen the desolation of San Francisco. So the minor prophets in the Old Testament are really anything but minor. She says they're the word of the Lord for the last days. So when we go to our Bibles and we're reading those prophecies, it may open our eyes to say there's more here than just a surface superficial reading and understanding. I want to go to the book of Jeremiah for a minute. Jeremiah, during Jeremiah's time, the last prophet in Judah, during Jeremiah's time, Judah, as they were still God's people, but they were steeped in violence, in idolatry, in self-worship, and yet they still considered themselves God's people. And God sent a message to his people. We find it in Jeremiah 17, 27. He says, but if you will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day, then will I kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Now let's look at this text here. It says he's going to kindle a fire, right? And he's going, it's going to devour the palaces of Jerusalem. Now that word palaces in the Old Testament is from the Hebrew word armon. You, those, those who know Hebrew, correct me if I didn't pronounce it exactly right. But the Hebrew word armon, which means high or elevated places, castles, palaces. And it says it shall not be quenched. Now, who lives in castles or palaces or great places? Kings, royalty, is it the poor people of the land? Is it the people working, work, earning minimum wage? No, no, it's, it's the well-to-do, the powerful. And it says the fire, it shall not be quenched. You know, in, Hebrew, in Hosea 8.14, it says, For Israel has forgotten his maker and buildeth temples. Well, what kind of temples do you think Israel was building? They're building temples to God? No. And Judah has multiplied fenced cities, but I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour the palaces thereof. When you look at the Old Testament, ten different times God says, in a form of judgment, I am going to kindle or send a fire upon the palaces. Ten different times the fire is coming upon the palaces, the high places, the elevated places. Jeremiah 6, 19, we read, Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. Why does God bring evil or judgment upon the earth? Because the earth has rejected his law, which Steve showed earlier in the Ten Commandments, the moral law, morality, Society rejects what God is offering. Is there a time coming, or is it already here, that society, that we're seeing society reject the law of God? And so what happens? The natural result is judgment comes. We ask the question, well, when, is there any indication in Scripture when these things are going to happen? Let's look at Joel ch chapter 2, starting with verse 23. It says, be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain. Verse 28 will continue, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. 
And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Very similar to the text that Steve was reading in Acts. Then it goes on to say, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. You remember how we learned earlier today that revival and God's judgments, there is a link between them. And here you see, when the Lord is talking about the time that Scripture describes as the latter rain, meaning the pouring out of God's Spirit, the lightening the world with the glory of God, comes at a time also of judgment, when there is blood and fire and pillars of smoke. We're going to move on here to uh, Joel, verse 32 says, And it shall come to pass, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is still a merciful God, because when the judgments start being poured out, it's a time of judgment mixed with mercy. Judgment mixed with mercy. In the book, Evangelism, page 27, it says, Ellen White says, I am bidden to declare the message that cities full of transgression and sinful in the extreme will be destroyed by earthquakes, by fire, by flood. You know, we see the judgments of God already in the land for some time. We go to the book, Our Father Cares, and she says, Strictly will the cities of the nations be dealt with, and yet they will not be visited in the extreme of God's indignation, because some souls will yet repent and be converted. You see, God wants to save every last person he can save. And he's not going to pour out the judgments unmixed with mercy until he has everybody in his kingdom who is willing to be there. So she says, while the mass will be treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath, the mass, the majority, you know in the Bible, the majority is almost always wrong. Do you know that? You know, it's in society that seems like the majority is always wrong. Do you, do you follow the broad highway or do you follow the narrow highway? We have a picture there of Nashville there. Ellen White had two distinct dreams of the coming judgments of God in terms of balls of fire. One of those dreams was in 1904 and it, she, was, she was here at Nashville at the time and the second one was in 1906. Now, there were some releases you find in, in some of her writings where she talked about a little of both dreams that have been in print for some time, but there was a, a number of statements that were not released by the White Estate until July of last year. And if you want more information on that, in the magazine, The Adventist Review, this past January or February, the White Estate published an article why these, these volumes of material uh, not just about balls of fire, but many things, including personal things she wrote to her family, why all these materials were sat in the vault for so long before they were transcribed and released on the Internet. And I should tell you that all these materials, all these quotes that we're going to put up here on the screen, you can go to the Ellen G. White Estate official website, go to the search engine, put in the information, and you can pull the quotes up for yourselves. But let's look at what she says about these two dreams. Now, it says here, this is letter 217, 1904. This is one of the Nashville dreams, and she says, The night before last, a very impressive scene passed before me. I saw an immense ball of fire fall into the midst of some beautiful mansions, causing their instant destruction. Now, when you see this, how many balls of fire does she indicate are here? One, all right? There's not two, there's not ten, it's not plural. She sees a single immense ball of fire. In the six times that she talks about this 1904 dream, every single one she refers to a single ball of fire coming down. Then she goes on to say, I heard some say, we knew that the judgments of God were coming upon the earth but we did not know they would come so soon. Others said, you knew, why did you not tell us? We did not know. On every side I heard such words spoken. All right, 
We're going to jump now to the 1906 dream, and I wanted to introduce the 1904 dream, and we're going to move to the 1906 dream now and look at something. She said, in the night, I was, I thought, in a room, but not in my own house. I was in a city where I knew not, and I heard explosion after explosion. I rose up quickly in bed and saw from my window large balls of fire. Jetting out were sparks in the form of arrows, and buildings were being consumed. I was instructed that destruction had gone forth upon cities. Cities, plural, all right? Notice also here that she says, how many balls of fire? There's more than one, all right? Balls of fire, it's plural, okay? It's a different dream, a different situation. She says, the word of the Lord will be fulfilled. Continuing, she says, I cried unto the Lord, what does it mean? These representations of destruction were repeated. So twice there. In scene, and then she's told, In scenes I have represented that which will be. But warn my people to cease from putting their trust in men who are not obedient to my warnings and who despise my reproof. For the day of the Lord is right upon the world when evidence shall be made sure. In other words, when you see these things happening, know the day of the Lord is right upon the world. This is it. Those who have followed the voices that would turn things upside down will themselves be turned where they cannot see, but will be as blind men. Manuscript 126, 1906. Now, when you look at this manuscript, and you can go in there and, and, Google, and pull this up, she actually talks about this dream twice. So we're going to go to the next representation. <clears throat> Again, it's manuscript 126, 1906. She says, in the night season, I had a presentation. I saw the whole heavens lighted up. There were balls that looked like fire falling, and these balls looked as if full of arrows, and wherever they struck, there were great calamities. Houses were set on fire, and no human effort could extinguish the flames. Does that sound like what we read in Jeremiah? The fire that cannot be quenched. When God sends a fire, you can't put it out. The earth quaked and homes were falling with a crash. I heard the distressing screeching and praying. There was confusion everywhere. I said to someone, do look. This is the most striking representation of what will be in the last day. Revelation 18. Voices were proclaiming the events taking place. Notice, what is Revelation 18 about? It's about, it's about the warning that God has given, the final warning to come out of false worship and to follow the God, God in truth at the same time that God is pronouncing judgments upon the world. So Revelation 18, voices were proclaiming the events taking place. So they knew, understood what was happening. Read and understand, for it will surely be. Chapter 19 of Revelation will ere long be fulfilled. What is Revelation 19? Is it Christ returning? Revelation 21, there were voices proclaiming the words of these chapters. With great power was the message given. Is there a time coming when the judgments are going to be poured out upon many cities? But she says that the words of Revelation 18, 19, and 21 are going to be proclaimed, and with great power will the message be given. Uh, continuing in Matthew 126, I am unable to sleep. It's 10 o'clock. I had a short nap, and I was instructed that light had been given me, and that I had written under special light the Lord had imparted. Now, if she wrote under special light the Lord had imparted, is that something that you and I should pay attention to? There were many things to come before the people. Collect these matters. The people need them. Moving on to the 1904 dream. So you, you got a little contrast between the two dreams because they're distinctly different. The Lord is soon coming in the clouds of heaven with power and with great glory. 
His terrible judgments are soon to fall upon our world. Are we doing all we can to warn Earth's inhabitants of these things? While I was in the South a few months ago, I had a very impressive dream. I seemed to see a great ball of fire. How many? One. A great ball of fire come from heaven and strike the earth. Great houses were in flames. You notice earlier, what was it that was in flames? When we, it was mansions. Now here she refers to it as great houses. Great houses were in flames, and many were looking on in great distress. Someone said, I knew that this was coming. How did they know it was coming, brothers and sisters? I knew that this was coming. I knew that God's judgments were soon to fall. You knew that these things were coming, said another. Why did you not tell us? Why did you not warn us and show us the prophecies that we might also know? Now, in her six descriptions of the Nashville dream, the ball of fire dream, in almost every one, there are two groups of people. You'll see. The first group, she says, says, I knew that this was coming. I knew it. I expected this. These are the judgments of God that I knew were coming. And the second group says, then why didn't you tell me? I didn't know. Manuscript 154, 1904. While I was in Nashville, a scene was opened before me. A great ball of fire seemed to fall from heaven, and from it went forth flashes of light. When these flashes of light would strike a building, the building would burn like tinder. And then I heard someone say, I knew that this was coming. These are the judgments of God that I knew were coming. How did they know? You knew, said another, you were my neighbor. Why didn't you tell me these things were coming? Why did you not warn others? You know, as we look at these writings, we see, we see her talking not about evangelistic meetings or putting money for great projects, but she says, why didn't you tell the person next to you? Why didn't you tell the mailman? or the person at the gas station, or the bank teller, or your neighbor next door. When I was at Nashville, I had been speaking to the people, and in the night season, there was an immense ball of fire that came right from heaven and settled in Nashville. There were flames going out like arrows from that ball. Houses were being consumed. Houses were tottering and falling. Now, she identifies who the people were, the, the, one of the two groups. She says, some of our people were standing there. Some of our people were standing there. It is just as we expected. It is just as we expected. It's just like we thought it was going to happen. It's just as we expected, they said. We expected this. Others were wringing their hands in agony and crying unto God for mercy. You knew it, said they. You knew that this was coming, and you never said a word to warn us. They seemed as though they would almost tear them to pieces to think they had never told them or given them any warning at all. Is that not a solemn warning for God's people? If you know this, are you sharing it? We all remember 9-11, and obviously if, if you had somebody in the towers that day and you knew what was coming, you would have wanted to give a warning, wouldn't you? It's interesting that Ellen White wrote in the, in the early 1900s, she wrote about seeing buildings rise story after story in New York into heaven. Did you know that? And the next she talked about an alarm of fire and that these buildings were destroyed and the firemen couldn't stop the destruction. And later that was published in a book called Nine Testimonies, volume, volume 9, starting on page 11. That's when the chapter started. Nine, I know it's kind of odd, 9-11, but it was actually published decades before 9-11 ever happened. But the interesting thing is that 
God gave Ellen White the dream of what was coming on New York when she was in New York. God gave Ellen White the dream of what was coming on Nashville when she was in Nashville. Last night, a scene was... Now, this is the very first time she ever talked about the 1904 Nashville dream. This is the very first time she talked about it. Last night, a scene was presented before me. I may never feel free to reveal all of it, so she had some hesitation about sharing this dream. It was such an impressive, startling dream to her. She had reservations about what she was going to share. But I will reveal a little. Because obviously, she wanted Nashville worked. Her burden was warn the cities, go into Nashville. She did not want people running away from Nashville. She wanted them to work the city. She wanted to work all the cities because she knew God's judgments were coming on all the cities. It seemed that an immense ball of fire came down upon the world and crushed large houses. From place to place rose the cry, the Lord has come, the Lord has come. Many were unprepared to meet him, but a few were saying, praise the Lord. Now, you might ask the question, why are people saying the Lord has come, the Lord has come? You remember that in each one of these recollections of her dream, there's two groups of people, right? All right? And there's the one that was expecting it, and there's the one that's scared and fearful. And right here, we again, we see two groups of people. One group is saying, the Lord has come, the Lord has come. Maybe they don't quite understand what's going on. Incidentally, there was a meteorite that was seen over El Salvador a couple of months ago. I read this, new, this article, and of course it lit up the sky, and the people, the local people there in that area were saying, when they saw this, they said, it's the apocalypse, it's the apocalypse, because they didn't know what was going on. That's just how they reacted. So here we see people saying, the Lord has come, the Lord has come. Many were unprepared to meet him, but a few were saying something different. They were saying, praise the Lord. Why are you praising the Lord, inquired those upon whom was coming sudden destruction. Why are you praising the Lord at a time like this? Because we now see what we have been looking for. If you believe that these things were coming, why did you not tell us, was the terrible response. We did not know about these things. Why did you leave us in ignorance? Again and again you have seen us. Why did you not become acquainted with us and tell us of the judgment to come and that we must serve God lest we perish? Now we are lost. There was a scene presented to me. It was the night before the Sabbath. That is when the scene was presented. I looked out of the window and there was an immense ball of fire that had come from heaven. And it fell where they were casting buildings with pillars. Especially the pillars were presented to me. And it seemed as if the ball came right to the building and crushed it. And they saw that it was branching out. Branching out. Enlarging. And they began to cry and mourn and mourn and wring their hands. And I thought some of our people stood by there saying, well, it is just what we have been expecting. In fact, she says, it is just what we have been talking about. And then she repeats it. It is just what we have been talking about. You knew it, said the people. You knew it, and you never told us about it. I thought there was such an agony in their face such an agony in their appearance. Now, there it talks about casting buildings with pillars. Is there any prominent building in Nashville that is known for its pillars? We visited one yesterday, and uh, there it is. And notice that it had pillars all the way outside, and Pillars on the inside, all right? It's a building full of pillars. Is that the building she saw? I don't know, but it certainly is the most prominent pillared building in Nashville. And what does it hold? 
All right, Athena, a pagan goddess, an idol of a pagan goddess. When we were there yesterday, visited, we noticed that the sign of the serpent was all over that goddess. Have you ever seen that? On her wrists, beside her, there's just a lot of very um, paganistic, paganistic idolatry there in that building. But it is very prominent here in Nashville. Now, I'm going to jump back here for a minute because... She says, our people, our people, Seventh-day Adventists, they were saying, we have been expecting this. In fact, it is just what we were expecting. Now, if something happens that's just what you were expecting, it's pretty close, right? It's pretty close to what you anticipated if it's just what you were expecting. But... She says, the Adventists say, twice she repeats it, not only was it just what we were expecting, but it's just what we were talking about. It's just what we were talking about. Now, here is the solemnity for Seventh-day Adventists. Before last July, Seventh-day Adventists could not have been talking about this because this wasn't released. Now that it's released, Seventh-day Adventists are talking about it. And in the dream, the dream comes to its fulfillment when the Adventists say, we were just talking about this. Now, when you use that term, we were just talking about this, is that something that happened 20 years ago? And I said, oh, I was just talking. No, it's pretty recent, you know. It's pretty recent. That is the solemnity of this dream. We were just talking about this. And boom, the event foretold occurs. So the question gets asked, how can I be ready for the Lord's return? Because undoubtedly there are people watching this, now live stream, or people who will be watching it, whom their hearts may not be right with God. But it's so simple. It's so simple. How can I be ready for the Lord's return? Three steps. One, get real with God. You know, we all oftentimes wear a mask. Did you know that? Come to church, you go to work, you, may, you wear the mask of who you really are. But with God, there's no mask. God can see. We sometimes leave the mask on anyway. But God can see and the first step is we need to be real with God about who we really are. Don't hold anything back. And the second is make a committed decision for Jesus Christ. Now, people can wonder, well, what does that mean, a committed decision? So imagine that two young people are getting married and they're going on their honeymoon. And one of them asks the other one, do you mind if I bring my ex-boyfriend or girlfriend on the honeymoon with us? That is not a committed decision. All right? Making a committed decision to Jesus Christ means that you give him all of your heart. All. Everything. You hold nothing back from Jesus Christ. That's a committed decision. You are totally his. You know, Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus isn't trying to keep, keep people out of heaven. He wants to save people. That's why he came to die. He wants people. He's knocking at the door of the heart. And third, learn to depend upon Christ for your help. Oftentimes, we depend upon each other for things we should de be depending upon the Lord for. Oftentimes, we kind of go around talking about all the drama in everybody's lives, including our own, or we have all the problems that we go and ask everybody about our problems when really we should be going to the Lord with our problems. We need to be learning to depend upon Him because learning to depend upon Him, we get to know Him better. And you remember, it's knowing Jesus, John 17, 3. This is life eternal, that they may know you, know the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's the way to salvation. Manuscript 233 in 1902, 
Ellen White says, the wrath of God will come upon all cities, upon dwellings, upon large buildings. There's those large buildings again. So suddenly that they who have the slightest intimation have no safety in dallying at all. They are to flee at once. Now, this statement here is, is interesting because it goes along with what Jesus says in Luke, and I believe in Matthew, where he talks about when Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. He says, those... You know, when you see this, there's a time coming when you just need to leave. And the intimation here is that the, if the Spirit ever tells you, you know, the time has come, you need to leave, well, then you need to leave, all right? That's what she's saying here. It doesn't mean everybody needs to leave this room today and run. That's not what she's saying. She said, but if the Spirit talks to you, if the Holy Spirit ever tells you, hey, if, you know, if you're in New York or L.A. or Seattle or somewhere, and the Spirit says, you need to leave, well, then you need to follow what the Spirit says. We are living amid the perils of the last days. The wrath of God is preparing to come, on, to come upon all cities, not all at once, but one after another. And if the terrible punishment in one city does not cause the inhabitants of other cities to be afraid and repent, their time will come. So when the judgments of God are poured out, they are poured out, if they're poured out upon one city, it's so that other cities will see the judgments and people will be repenting because God is about saving people. He wants people to be saved. We're in an earth that's going down. The earth is going down, but God wants to save everybody out of it that he can before it goes down. She goes on to say, the destruction will begin in certain places and the destruction of life will be sudden and few will escape. So it is, it's solemn. It's solemn. When God's judgments come, is a solemn thing. It's nothing to take lightly. In Amos chapter 4, verse 11, it says, I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. How were they overthrown? Fire from heaven. And you were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. In other words, you were one that didn't get destroyed. I sent my judgments, I sent the fire, and you weren't destroyed. I saved you for a reason. He's talking to Israel. Yet you have not returned to me. Thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. Amos 4, verse 12. God is sending judgments in mercy, but he's saying, after these judgments, prepare to meet your God. The time has come. I am instructed by Revelation to say that the most solemn and overwhelming judgments are determined upon all people who have the light before them in the word of God, but who do not follow it. It is a solemn message. But yet, it's a message of warning, and it's a message of responsibility. We have been charged with giving a message. And the message isn't simply, oh, God's judgments are going to fall upon the city. No, the message is to tell people how they can find refuge and safety in Jesus Christ. How they can know Jesus Christ for themselves. What Jesus means to you. That's the only hope of safety. Tilly Smith was vacationing with her parents on a beach in Thailand in 2004. And as they were out there on the beach, beautiful day, they noticed something very odd out there on the water. Um, and it didn't look right. They didn't look right. And as they're looking out there, Tilly said to her mom, Mom, I know what this sign means. This means there's going to be a tsunami. I studied this in school, Mom. And the mom said, oh, yeah, you know, it's a little girl. She's only 10. It doesn't matter. And she says, no, mom, please. Something's going to happen. I studied this. This means there's going to be a tsunami. I saw this in a film. And her mom thought, well, she did take a class, and they had to talk about tsunamis, and she did watch a film on it. Well, maybe we should go and talk to your dad. And so she, mom was kind of wavering until he said, mom, if you don't do something, I'm going to do it. So they went over, and they talked to the dad, and the dad went over and talked to the lifeguard, and the lifeguard evacuated the beach. And the, just minutes before the tsunami, 2004, came rolling in. Tilly Smith was credited with saving over 100 lives that day because she wasn't afraid to give the warning. Brothers and sisters, are we afraid to give the warning to our friends, to our neighbors, and to the people we meet? Thank you, Tim. Praise God. Wow. <clears throat> Thank you.
Thank you. Okay, if we could switch over to my slides. I just have a few more to share with you. <coughs> well, this is uh, amazing information, don't you think? Yes. Okay, let's see. No, that's not, uh, okay, I got it. We're fine. There we go. <coughs> Tim and I, in our ministry, Whitehorse Media, <coughs> we are deeply convicted that this is a time of Bible prophecy happening right in front of our eyes. The fact that, as Ellen White saw in her dream, that people said, this is just what we were talking about. What are you going to be talking about when this meeting's over? <laughs> exactly this, that's right. And she saw this time. Just like God showed Noah what was coming, just like God showed Abraham what was coming, God has done this all throughout history. <clears throat> He's doing it today again. We are living in the times so of the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And, and uh, make no mistake about it, these things are not just, are not just in dreamland. <laughs> these things are real. Here's a couple of articles. I don't know if you've seen this. This one's from the Dallas Morning News. This was this year, March 24, 2016, from NASA. That meteor that broke up over North America, over North Texas, I'm sorry, over North Texas Saturday night was actually an Earth grazing fireball. So here is a Dallas Morning News using the same, the same language. And here's another one. This is from uh, WAFF, actually here, WSMV, uh, which is television in Nashville. It says here the headline, two confirmed fireballs streak over Tennessee, visible to all, or visible, visible in Alabama, AL, Huntsville, Alabama. Officials with the Marshall Space Flight Center confirmed Monday night that two fireballs occurred in the skies early, earlier in the evening. Two distinct and unrelated fireballs were seen to the west of where? Nashville. Of Nashville at 6.46 p.m. and 7.31 p.m. on Monday. Dr. Bill Cook with the MSFC said the streak of light caused the first fireball, caused by the first fireball was brighter than the planet Venus. This first fireball traveled from west to east just north of the town of Dixon, Tennessee. So, wow, here we have news reports talking about fireballs, and the word Nashville's right there. Ellen White saw in her dream a fireball eventually coming onto Nashville, and she saw these coming not just on Nashville, so don't think that, you're, that this city, you know, is, uh, is somehow worse than a lot of other cities. You know, I, I'm not, we're not saying that. Uh, it's not for us to interpret what's going on in Nashville. Uh, we just know what we're told and what the information is. And this is information that God is giving to us right now. He's helping us to know what's coming. And as Tim shared, over and over again, the people said, why didn't you tell us? Why didn't you warn us? And we have taken this information very, very seriously. We believe it. And that's why we're doing this. And that's why we have created a brand new website, warnthecities.com, which this, uh, this day's events are being streamed live. And people are watching this right now. Who knows how many places people are watching this. Uh, we have resources on this site. There's a resource link that has the, the book, the new book, The Coming Judgments of God, that all of you received uh, after lunch. We have this flyer, The Coming Judgments of God, which is a smaller flyer as compared to the book. There's more information in the book. And then we also have the Fire from the Sky track that deals specifically with, uh, with the dreams that talk about Nashville. I was sitting on a plane on the way here, and as we were coming into Nashville, there were two ladies that were sitting next to me. They told me that they both lived right in the outskirts of Nashville. I happened to have one of those flyers with me, and we got into quite a discussion. And uh, she actually said she knows, she knows Pastor Hartman. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't remember what her name was. <laughs> I don't remember, but we had quite a discussion, and I gave her that flyer. I said, you need, you need to read this. Amen. You need to read this information. Now, the main coming Judgments of God track and the book is primarily to be given to everybody. The other track is more inside information uh, and things that, that we've been talking about here. Uh, just a few more things to say 
and then we'll move toward winding this up. Uh, this is all developing to us as well. You know, we're letting the Lord, we're praying to God to lead us. We, you know, this is still a full house here, and we're Saturday afternoon, and the fact that you're all here after lunch shows us that you are very interested in this topic. And there's a lot of people that are watching this right now on the stream, and there are others that are going to be watching it once this is made onto a DVD. And our conviction is this is growing and developing. We would like to, at some point, Lord willing, if we can get funding, uh, and everything costs something, we would like to hire someone to really make this website just fabulous. Uh, we have an, I, an internet technology man that's got a lot of other responsibilities at Whitehorse Media. He's put this site together very quickly, but we would like to develop this and make this into a major site that has a whole lot of uh, information on it, and we're even discussing and praying about the idea that at some point, sending the word out, creating advertisements that can be put on billboards around the country. So let's say New York or Chicago or Las Vegas, people can buy billboard space that will say something like the judgments of God or are the judgments of God coming to America or to the world? Learn the facts at warnthecities.com. And then we'll have all kinds of information on there that will be geared toward the public, geared toward people off the street, seeing a billboard, going onto this site, and then getting the information that we need, that they need. We, we, we're really serious about this. You know, we want to get this information out. Uh, we want, you know, as we're told, we need to warn the cities. And we want to do this. And so we're praying. We don't know exactly how all this is going to unfold, but we are praying and we believe that God is going to take the reins into his own hands. God is going to take charge of his work. God is going to do things in the last days that are going to be big things, and we want to be part of that. And, and there's a lot of people that are going to, be, going to be doing a lot of things. And may the Lord help us to be involved in what he wants us to do. Uh, I shared this with you this morning. Revelation chapter 18, verse 1 says, I saw another angel coming down from heaven having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. That's what Revelation 18.1 says, which is a, a Bible verse that predicts God's final revival in the world. In the midst of the darkness, the light is going to shine. The light of Jesus and his love is going to shine. And then when you read the rest of the chapter, the rest of chapter 18 is all about the judgments of God coming upon Babylon, about false religion, about people being called to come out of Babylon before the plagues fall. Uh, Revelation 18, if you just look at that real quick, Revelation 18, verse 2, talks about Babylon falling. Verse 4 says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, lest you receive of her plagues, and those are judgments. Verse uh, 8 says, Therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. So these are judgments. So in Revelation 18, we have revival connected to judgments. Uh, Tim stressed this also in the book of Joel. It's in the book of Acts. It's in the book of Revelation. And as I shared with you earlier, it's in the book Great Controversy. The book that Ellen White wrote, Great Controversy, page 464, before the final visitation of God's judgments upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. The spirit and the power of God will be poured out upon his children. And it sure seems to us that that time is now that we're, we're there, we're, or we're right at the beginning stages. The judgments of God are in the earth, and they're increasing, and they're going to continue to increase, and now we've got the information. Now it's come out to light. Now we're talking about it. That God is, uh, we believe that God is, is, is wanting to spark a movement, a movement around the world. That's why we're streaming this live right now from Nashville. We want this to be part of a movement that stir people up, that put them on their knees, confessing their sins, seeking God, seeking Jesus, and saying, Lord, change my life, clean me up, and get me ready, and help me to do my part. Help me to do my part in sharing God's word. Um, 
in the dream, she saw that Revelation 18, Revelation 19, Revelation 21, that these chapters are going to be preached with boldness. Now, I can see that our time is, uh, is winding down for, for the third segment. There's a couple things I want to do before we finish this. And at the end of the last segment, when we have the Q&A, we're going to spend a little more time reading from chapter 18. We're going to read from chapter 19. We're going to read from chapter 21, exactly as we're told to do. You know, it's amazing. Uh, in chapter 19, also talks about the judgments of God. And then it talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. And verse 10 talks about the spirit of prophecy, that God will have a people who have the spirit of prophecy. That's Revelation 19.10. Verses 11 to 16 describe the second coming of Christ on a white horse. That's why we picked the name White Horse Media. The rest of the chapter describes the judgments of God upon the world. Then chapter 21 talks about the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem and how there's going to be a time when there's no more pain, no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more death. I tell you, we're in the home stretch. We're in the home stretch. And these are the chapters <coughs> that are in the Bible. And again, for those that are watching this and who may not be familiar with Ellen White's writings, it's so clear in the Bible that God raises up messengers to give messages to people when they need it the most. And Jesus also said, he said to the Jewish leaders, he said, I send you prophets, wise men, and teachers. And he said, some of them you will crucify, some of them you will stone, some of them you will, you will uh, you know, reject in different ways. It's always been true that God's messengers have always been rejected by many. They've been mocked. It's always been that way. And God wants us to be among those that don't uh, go against his messengers, but who accept them as coming from him. Jesus said, if you receive, whoever receives the one I send receives me. That's what he said. And whoever receives me, he said, receives the one who sent me. Jesus said that. So God wants us to listen and to accept the counsel that he has given us in his, in his word. All right, uh, before we have a closing time of prayer, uh, I'm going to invite Pastor Melvin Santos, who's the pastor of this church, and Pastor Dave Hartman. Uh, pastor Dave, would you, maybe you can come up here and sit down. And uh, I'd just like to give just a few minutes <clears throat> to both of these men to just share with you how this all has impressed them. And then when they're done, uh, uh, Tim will come up, and then we're just going to kneel together, and as we close the live, the live stream, we're going to close by praying. Tim will pray, I'll pray, uh, both of these pastors will pray, because, brothers and sisters, if we're going to have a revival, we've got to be praying. Amen. So we're going to close with prayer in a little bit, and then we'll take a break, then we'll come back for the question and answer period, which will be our last segment. So, uh, Pastor Melvin, why don't you come up, and then Pastor Dave, you can join, you can join me. Every Sabbath from the pulpit, I show a picture of an hourglass and then the second coming to remind our members and those who attend and worship that every message that they hear from this pulpit is in the context of the soon coming of Jesus to prepare people what we can do to advance God's work and finish the work in Nashville and beyond. That's usually my, my statement when I say just before I enter to the message. Camp meetings, I received several emails from my wife, and then from when camp meeting, camp pitch started, several of the pastors gathered together. They said, by the way, did you hear about this? And so I said, yes, I read about this. And so we began to continue to talk. Uh, as we took breaks within our work there, we talked about what should we do about this as pastors. And here being right here in the heart of Nashville, in, in the area of Nashville pastors, we said we need to gather, ga uh, gather the pastors together and do something. We cannot sit on this because this is just too of an important information just to let it slide. Because people are saying, well, this is really talking about the general, uh, general judgment of God. And no, no, well, you cannot ignore the facts that are there. And so let's pray. Let's come together. Let's talk and pray and ask God for direction. So uh, it was just in July the 6th, the area pastors of, uh, in Nashville gathered together right here. We opened the words of God, opened the writings of Ellen White. 
and studied and reviewed and discussed and said, what does it mean? What do we need to do? And so right then and there, there were several people said, we need to be able to, to make some contacts. And there was one, um, uh, several of us, even at camp pitch, I mean, camp meeting before it ended, said, we need to be able to connect. Somebody said, uh, um, I think they're here today. I don't remember the name. They knew uh, Tim Saxton. And I said, well, let's, let's connect with White Horse Media. And I said, I know Steve from many years ago. And so, yes, let's do it. God seemed to open the doors rapidly. And so we knew this was the work of God. Amen. And as we, that's why you are here today, because we stepped out in faith. We said, we cannot wait any longer. We said, well, we have vacations and all that. No, we need to do it right now. We need to do right now. We need to be asking God to be pouring out his spirit so that way his people can be finding, getting not only the instruction, but taking actions right away. And so the results that why you're here today is because God has opened the door. We stepped forward. And now it's going to be your turn to step forward in faith as we talk in the next session. Well, I guess a couple weeks before camp meeting, uh, Keith Knoll passed on the brochure from Whitehorse Media, and uh, I read that, I consumed it, and I tell you, my heart's been heavy. You know, God, what do I do with this? Now that I know this, what do I do with this? And I have done some intense study, kind of like Tim Braxton, uh, like Pastor Wahlberg, um, because I believe, folks, we, I would challenge you to go online to the Ellen White estate, look at these statements because you need to dig out for yourself what God's servant is saying. What has been brought to you this weekend by Pastor Wahlberg, Pastor Braxton, um, you, you know, you need to see it for yourself. You need to be praying, God, what do you want me to do with this? So that's what I did. And there were two convictions that came out as I wrestled with this myself. First of all, I read all the, the two visions and all the statements. There was the July 1 vision, 1904, where Ellen White was here. She was making a presentation before the Southern Pub Publishing Company and so forth. Uh, sh she was talking about getting the work going here in the South. And there were six follow-up statements where she wrote about this vision. And in half of those, after she sees the fireball hitting Nashville, she sees another scene with a group of people and a map spread out before them. Half of these instances, the map is mentioned. And on this map, there are dots of light representing God's desire for the, the global work. This isn't just about Nashville. This is about God's heartfelt cry for a dying world. And so all these points of light, these dots of light, points of light, seems like uh, there was a president that talked about points of light one time. God had it first, talking about his points of light. He wants all the cities and villages to be, to be warned. In fact, in, in one of those where the map spread out, she says, I saw jets of light. Remember that one? Going to every city and village. So this is about God's desire for us to be active wherever we're at. I don't think God is calling for a, a stampede on Nashville. God is calling you to get into your community, into your neighborhood, and to pour out your heart to your neighbors and your friends. Now, here's the second conviction that God's laid on me. How do we approach this? And this is what God has laid. I see two approaches. First, I want to call the tabloid approach. All right? You all ever gone through the, the supermarket? You see the tabloid. Sometimes you've got to close your eyes. The tabloids are, are pretty gross. Uh, the tabloid approach. Um, that would be, that approach I would call putting billboards out Fireballs hit Nashville. Ellen White predicted. 800 number. What are people going to do if they see that kind of approach? Primarily, pandemonium. They may move out of the city where they missed the fireball, but they haven't met Jesus still as their Savior, right? All right? 
that I, I can just imagine him Googling Ellen White and what kind of sites pop up first when you Google Ellen White. We don't want that, folks. There is a, a parallel thing that I read. I'm going to come back to the other approach that I think is more sensible. Uh, in Life Sketches, you've heard of that by Ellen White. In the chapter 55, starts with page 407, uses the example of another city that Ellen White said things were going to happen to. That's New York, where these buildings falling and being swept away by waves and so forth. Uh, here, she uses the example of a well-meaning brother who published startling notices regarding the destruction of New York City by a tidal wave, and she wrote this to the brother. It is not wise to publish such notices, that thus an excitement might be aroused which would result in a fanatical movement hurting the cause of God. This is classic. Listen to this. She says, it is enough. It is enough to present the truth of the word of God to the people. Startling notices are detrimental to the progress of God's work. Amen. I would caution against a tabloid approach. Now, folks, in our media, we're still praying through this. I mean, uh, we need my neighbors, people of this city, they need to know about this fireball stuff. I'm not saying don't say that, but I'm saying that the big billboards and the mass mail, fireballs, Ellen White, I think that, that's going to cause more damage than what it's worth. Here's the other approach, the personal approach. And as I read these six articles where Ellen White talked about the Nashville fireballs, 95%, she talks about methodology. I challenge you to look at these statements. She doesn't talk about pandemonium, billboards. They didn't have them back then. She didn't talk about the fireball approach. She steered away from that. She talked about the personal approach, and she said, get acquainted with your neighbors. Learn the word of God, the truth, the three angels' message yourself, and share this with them. Go door to door. She talks about house to house work. You, you've heard those statements, haven't you? I believe this is time, folks, that we quit just depending on the conference to roll out big old evangelistic meetings and we roll up our sleeves as an army of Adventist remnant people and let's get to work. You need to get to know your neighbor. Do you know their name? Have you shared personally with them your personal conviction that Jesus is coming soon? Here's the reasons why. And I'd love to study with you why I believe that. I just would urge of you to pray through the approach that God would have you to have. I'm still processing through that. And may God lead all of us. Because in the final analysis, Ezekiel 3 and Ezekiel 33 calls us watchmen on the walls. And uh, we have to warn our cities and our country and our world that Jesus is coming soon. And the final message to go to planet Earth, right before the reaping vision in chapter 14 of Revelation, where Jesus is coming with sickle in his hand, he reaps the wheat, and they go home with him, and he reaps the grapes, and they get put into the vat where they're trampled on. That's the destruction of the wicked. Right before that final cataclysmic event on planet Earth, there's this three angels message. And I would urge you to dig that out, dust that off, and comprehend it, and understand it, and study it, and share that in a personal approach. May God help us. Thank you. Are we still on here? Yes, we are. Okay. I've taken my mic off because I don't think we have roving mics, or do we? The, uh, Tim and uh, Pastor Melvin... And uh, Pastor Dave, if we could all come up here together, and if you need me to hand you this mic or we can use this mic, uh, we're just going to spend a little time in prayer. We'd like you to pray with us. As Pastor Dave said, we definitely need to have the right approach 
Uh, if we do a billboard approach, we do want it to be sensible and not uh, extreme. Not against the billboard approach, a sensible billboard approach. Yeah, that's right, a sensible billboard approach, that's right. And the personal approach, we need to do all the things that we can do under the Lord's guidance in a wise way, in an intelligent way, in a Christ-centered way that will reach people with God's message in these final days. So let's pray. Let's just spend some time in prayer together. I will, uh, why don't I ask uh, Tim, why don't you start? And you've got a mic, okay? And then we'll go to Pastor Melvin and then Pastor Dave, and then I'll finish. Then we'll take a break and we'll come back for our last time of questions. Let's pray. <clears throat> Loving Father in heaven, Lord, as we come before you on this Sabbath afternoon, Lord, we thank you for your spirit and for the revealing, Lord, of the truths and the revealing of yourself to your people. We thank you for who you are, and that you are a God of mercy and love, and that everything about you, Lord, is about centered on what's best for your creation. We thank you for who you are, and we know, Lord, that in love you are trying to reach the people around us. You are trying to reach the hearts of the men and women in this world who don't know you who would still be candidates for your kingdom. And we unite in asking in prayer, Lord, that your spirit would be poured out, would be poured out specifically on Nashville, Lord, for we are here today. We pray that your spirit would be poured out upon the people who are watching this and the people who are here in this church today, that they will go out with the boldness of your spirit and share the love of Jesus, who Jesus really is, with the people around them, and there might be a revival, Lord, a revival of primitive godliness to your honor and glory, and that souls will be eternally in the kingdom. For Jesus' sake, amen. Loving Father, we have heard present truth. We have heard solemn messages. We have heard from your words, from prophetic words. How do we respond? Lord, we cannot respond because of fear. But what we need this Lord to respond is to draw even closer to you. We need to understand to comprehend this and realize that it's high time we draw even closer to Jesus, that we need to make sure we have that love relationship with Jesus. And so that way we can, when we have this, Lord, and when we go out to share these this warning messages, we go out with zeal. We're able to share with boldness. We realize there is something that we have to, to respond. We have to respond. We need to, to step out in faith. Father, I'm claiming Jeremiah 33 3. You said, Call upon me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. We want to see you glorified and honored, Lord, in a mighty way. We need instruction. You promised in Psalm 32, 8, and I will instruct you and guide, guide you with my eye. And Lord, we want you to instruct us. We want you to teach your people how to respond, how to go about this. Lord, we are ready. We have invited your presence. We have surrendered all to you. And now we need your specific instructions. We pray, dear Lord, that at the end of this session here, as we agonize in prayer with you this today and through the next few days, that you will give us specific instruction what we need to do ourselves individually for our families and for our churches. We will step out in faith and thank you in advance that you've heard our prayers. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, I want to thank you for speaking at this time of Earth's history. We don't understand why these particular articles were held up in a vault somewhere, but we know that your providence maybe kept them hidden for such a time as this. 
And Lord, we are begging of you and asking of you that you would show us the response that you would have us to do, not just as a conference, not just as an institution, not just even as a collective church, but Lord, as a family and as a, an Adventist Christian or whatever church you may be as you're tuning in. Lord, what would you have me to do with this information? We want to be used by you. Like Isaiah, we tremble. We are nothing. But you have said, you've anointed our lips, you've cleansed our heart, and who will go for us? We want to respond. Hear my Lord, send me. Thank you, Lord, for raising up a task force, an army of youth and workers don't have to be ordained ministers, don't have to have been to the seminary, but raise up a task force of passionate people who care for the people of this city and whatever town and village you live in, sharing the good news that Jesus is coming soon and hears how to have hope and peace in, in knowing him and embracing him and being ready for these final times. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Dear Father in heaven, Father, my heart is uh, full of joy, and I'm very solemn as well as I think about what's coming. And I, I want to thank you for what you've done this weekend.